Welcome to Let's Regroup Building Stronger Citizens. I am your host, Alethea Thompson. And today, if you've been following all of my videos, you'll notice that I have a side by side now. So we figured that part out. Um, <laughs> on the line with me today, I have Jed Cartwright. He is a police officer in real life. And one of the subjects that he uses to help him get through his days is verbal judo. Verbal judo was created by George Thompson and he ran a school for a long time. Uh, I'll give you a link in the below to a organization that still runs his operation and you can go there and you can learn more about it. So, Jed, how's your day? Not too bad. How about you? Not too bad. So what are some okay. things that people can pick up on uh, as far as like verbal judo? Because it sounds like I'm going to take somebody and arm bar them to the ground with words. Actually, verbal judo was, uh, as you mentioned, was created by a gentleman named George Thompson. He was an English professor who had thoughts on de-escalating situations verbally. And he had several students who were active duty police officers. And they challenged him because they said, these methods will never work in the field. He actually went to the police academy, became a part-time police officer, and put his methods to use in the field. Once it was seen that his methods did work, it became widely accepted within law enforcement as a viable method to verbally de-escalate situations. It creates quite a few things within law enforcement. Number one, it creates an era of professionalism. Complaints went down, I believe, by as much as 80%. And all in all, it's just a, a viable method. It's an effective method. As with anything, you'd rather de-escalate the situation verbally and uh, everybody goes about their business in, uh, in, in much better physical shape. And the, there, there are a few components to verbal judo. First and foremost, you have empathy in the situation. Empathy is defined as understanding someone's emotions, their feelings, or their motives. Most times, people listen to why they don't necessarily listen to understand. Does that mean everything has to be a kumbaya moment? No, it doesn't. Sometimes you're understanding the underlying issues. Sometimes it might be about survival. With verbal judo, you have to take into consideration it's not just something that is applicable to law enforcement. It can be applicable to anything in your everyday life, from road rage to a, a supervisor who thrives on conflict. So, How many times have you ever had a supervisor that thrived on conflict? That, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Sometimes you don't care what the underlying issue is. You don't care what their problem is. Sometimes, I, I think for all of us, we want to get up, we want to go to work, we want to go through our day, and we want to go home. And I don't think anybody looks forward to going into work knowing that you have a supervisor who's just itching to pick a fight with anybody, looking for a conflict, looking for some form of an argument. So, as I said, it's not strictly law enforcement. It could be anything. It could be anything at all. Like I said, you could be a, it could be a neighbor who you don't get along with. It could be road rage. It could be a supervisor. It, it could be anything. So... When you talk about road rage, you're talking about the person that gets out of the car itself and comes and yells at you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, when I was, when I was younger, I, I had a friend who, he's driving down the highway and he, 
cut somebody off, apparently. He didn't know it. And this guy flew into a rage, and he's, he's chasing my friend for literally miles. And at one point, the guy just sped off. So my buddy is thinking, all right, well, I guess he's had enough. And what he didn't realize was he came over the hill on this four-lane highway. And here is this guy. He had sped up, pulled to the side, got out of his car, and he's standing in the middle of the four-lane highway waiting for my buddy. Isn't that illegal? You're going to get yourself killed. Not just illegal. I mean, that's borderline psychotic. And so my buddy passes him, and he goes up, and he gets off on his exit, and he has a red light, and there's a series of red lights. And he looks in his rearview mirror, and here comes this guy. He just doesn't give up, does he? (laughs) No, he wasn't giving up. He wasn't giving up. And so he came up to my buddy's car, and he's pounding on the window. And my buddy just looks at him, and he said, look. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I wasn't trying to cut you off. I didn't see you. And the guy just all of a sudden he snapped. It's like, oh, oh, well, just be more careful next time. That was it. The guy left. The guy <laughs> left. So, with verbal judo, it, it's one of those things. I don't know if that would necessarily be a. Uh, an example of verbal judo per se, but some of the components of verbal judo are there. Number one, you have to let your ego go. You have to be, you're in control of a situation, but you might not be directly in control per se. Uh, there's a psychological aspect of, of we, there is, you're, you're creating a, a, a team. Uh, trying not to present yourself as the adversary. Not, trying not to present yourself as a target, per se. You're literally in, in law enforcement, uh, in, in a volatile situation, I might say to somebody, whoa, 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 whoa. Say, say I get on the scene and they're yelling. So what you want to do is you want to turn around and you don't want to present yourself as that target. So you, you, you talk in a very uh, monotone way and you might say to someone, well, hold, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Am I yelling at you? And 99 times out of 100, they'll turn around and say, ah, but I'm just frustrated. Okay, all right, well, I'm not yelling at you. So why are you yelling at me? Why don't you come on over here, we'll talk, and we will figure out what's going on. And you presented yourself not as a target. You presented yourself in a non-adversarial way. And you present yourself as part of a team. We. Why don't you come over and we will talk this out. We will figure out what's going on. Now, it's interesting you bring up that particular type of situation. I have read his books a long, long time ago. Actually, I guess it was just one book. Uh, the it, it was actually something that Andy, a, a mutual friend of ours, had rec- recommended me to read. Well, <laughs> I remember that there was also a little bit of non-lingual programming in one of the uh, examples he had, which was this police officer shows up. There's a couple yelling and screaming. He hears it. He walks somewhere where he can get into the house, sits at the table and picks up a newspaper and just starts reading it. And when they realized he that he was there, they look at him like, what the hell? Who are you? <laughs> and right. then he just started he talking the to them. Yeah, he broke the tension with that. There was another, another example he gave where he went for a domestic and this guy started yelling at him. And he's insulting him, and he's saying, you're overweight, and, you know, you, you fat load. And 
he turned it around on the guy. He, he turned around and he said, well, you know, I've been trying to lose some weight here, but I appreciate you noticing that. Thanks for the, uh, the encouragement. <laughs> and, and the guy continued to yell at him. And finally, he'd had enough. And he said to the guy, he said, I can't believe you. I can't believe that you're yelling at me. There's one guy, one guy for 40 miles who came out here to help you with your issue. And that's me. And you're yelling at me. You've got some nerve. And the guy turned around. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. You know, hey, I, I appreciate you coming out here. So what you're trying to do again is you're trying to not present yourself as that adversary. Uh, when you deal with situ situations, uh, certain situations, people are frustrated. They want to vent. Sometimes you let them vent. One of the things you don't want to do, regardless of the situation, whatever it might be, don't tell people to calm down. Again, let them vent. Uh, there is a certain situational awareness involved. It's not always applicable. Like I said, it could be the road rage incident. Sometimes people are just venting. Sometimes it's escalating upward. Sometimes it's escalating downward. With, with a situational awareness, you, you need to be aware of that. But like I said, don't tell people to uh, don't tell people to calm down. And, and the, the example that I gave previously, <clears throat> you know, you, you want to turn around and you you know, well, I'm not yelling at you. Why are you yelling at me? Why don't you come on over here? And we'll talk for a few minutes. Okay, so it's always placing it on to because this is kind of hard for people to understand. And that was one of the problems I had with the book was well, one, it looked like it was selling his program instead of actually it, it was like one big advertisement instead of actually telling you what you were supposed to be doing. But if you read between the lines, you could kind of tell. In what you're saying here. <clears throat> Instead, you're not trying, uh, you specifically do not go with commands. You go with, I'm responsible to, for this situation. Absolutely. Again, that, that is creating that, that environment of, of we. And you're, you're, you're asking them, what you're doing is, you are, again, you are in control of the situation, but you're presenting it in a way to make it seem as though everybody is on even ground. You're asking them as opposed to telling them. Can I talk to you? As opposed to telling someone, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. You're putting them, you're putting them in a defensive position. But if you turn around, hey, hey can, I, can I talk to you for a minute? Why don't you come on over here? Why don't you talk to me? Let's figure out what's going on. Why don't you tell me what's going on tonight? Or in a road rage incident, you know, again, same thing. Or a, a supervisor who thrives on conflict, or even a co-worker who thrives on conflict, simply saying to the person, hey, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, there seems to be some tension here, and, and I'm not really sure why. Is there something I did? Some, something that we can, uh, we can talk about? Something we can square up? And again, you, you put it on even ground, and to an extent, you're you're kicking it back to them, and maybe it's a situation where you, you have a coworker who's frustrated about something else, or maybe you're causing them to examine their own motives. And again, like I said, with a coworker, maybe 
a situation might not resolve itself in that they apologize. It might resolve itself in that they go when they go after somebody else. And so it's, you're resolving the situation. There's no guarantee that you're going to resolve the situation to your exact liking, but you're still resolving the situation one way or the other in that, you know, hey, you're, you're going to go pick on somebody else. Now, where the situation goes from there, it's fluid. It's ever-changing. So obviously, there's going to be different uh, stimuli and information that's going to present itself. And not to get off track, but if you resolve the situation and they go to pick on somebody else, maybe you pull that other person aside and say, hey, look, here's how I resolved it. Maybe this is how you can resolve it as well. And enough so, people like, do that, yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, now, okay, so I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. When I was doing research on uh, whether or not police actually end up killing black people more often than white people, I think you remember me doing that whole long, far, like, five-part, every county by state thing. Right. One of the things that I noticed was that a lot of uh, there were quite a few situations between the different ones where uh, these problems escalated in close quarters. Now, close quarters, for those of you that don't know and are watching this, that means basically inside of a house somewhere that it's kind of more confined. It's not open space. So we would, you could sit there and you could try to reason with them using verbal judo, but that doesn't seem to always be the case and it doesn't seem to always work or are they just not trained in it? I mean, what's your perspective on the police involved shootings that happen in close quarters, whether it's, I don't care what race they are. <laughs> um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to present an answer and uh, I don't want it to seem like I'm sidestepping. What I was told in the academy, what I was taught in the academy is you weren't there, so you don't know. And I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, you don't know what's going on. And, you know, if, if, you can, if you can separate parties, if you can create space, if you can uh, create uh, or maintain officer safety, what gets lost in a lot of these situations is that if you're in a bigger department, you might run into a situation where you get a bad call, bad domestic, whatever it might be, and you have four officers on scene. If you are talking about uh, smaller departments, if you're talking about cats in the video now, <laughs> if you're in smaller departments, if you're talking about something like, if you've ever seen the, the reality TV show Alaska State Troopers, you're on by yourself. You're it. And so you have so many other things to maintain. Have I worked with officers who just don't uh, don't care for verbal judo. Yes, I have. Uh, but the vast majority, and I do mean the vast, vast majority of the officers that I have worked with, uh, believe in verbal judo. Basically, some people... And again, I wasn't there. I don't know. Some people, whether through alcohol or narcotics or just their own outlook, they want to fight. They want to fight. 
You can't talk them down. There's nothing that you're going to say. Uh, there was there was a situation. I think it was. I think I think it was Kansas, and uh, was an officer involved shooting. The officer was killed, and the guy was live streaming on Facebook saying. Well, unless you commit suicide, don't commit suicide. There's a suicide hotline, call them. Unless you're going to commit suicide, that's kind of a difficult thing to say. I'm not going to jail. Right, right, exactly. And, and that's the thing, is I'm not going back to jail. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? There, there's nothing that, there's nothing you can say. It was the, the, the quote from the Batman movie, some people just want to watch the world burn. Well, can you draw from an from can you draw from a difficult situation? I mean, I'm pretty sure I've never seen you in the news as having shot somebody that ended up dying. Um but when you deal with a situation, how often is it that you personally have to deal with a guy that or a gal that does not want to comply and you have to take them to the ground because they just don't want to listen to you? Like, how often does verbal judo work for you? It's worked the vast, vast majority of the time it really has because I'm 5'7", I weigh 150 pounds. That's the way it is. And I, I operate on the illusions that I am 6'2", 220, and built like a brick wall. So... <laughs> So how many people, okay, because now I used to be military police and I didn't get any really crazy situations, but I think probably because I'm a woman, I just, everybody turned off their guard. I don't know. <laughs> and I was always with small, small departments also. So, uh, you know, I know it worked to my favor and I didn't really have to use verbal judo. It wasn't really my thing. And I, I would have loved to have used it if I had to get into a situation. I just never did. But I've heard, you know, I, I have friends that come up and they tell me all sorts of crazy stories about how something happened, large crowds, this, this and that. How big do you think a group needs to be before the verbal judo just goes out the window? And you're just like, nope, not going to deal with it. Obviously, a bar fight would probably be one. You're not going to be able to get anybody to shut up. <laughs> There is no uh, one size fits all man. 
So I think I got two steps, but can you reiterate what those steps are for the rest of the audience as we close out this episode? Unless you have other things to add. I don't know. Did you have other things to add? I'm sorry if I'm cutting you short. I did, no, I don't know. That's okay. That's okay. Cool. I didn't actually know about the the uh, seminar that you can find. Vistler, I believe, is the name of the organization. I get sometimes I get emails from them. Um, they basically send in out little tidbits for people to remember. Ever so often, you get on their little email list, and especially with businesses, because a lot more often than not, that people are going to be dealing with businesses. I mean, let's face it. The majority of them are not police, not in any capacity of law enforcement. So it's going to be more business oriented. And I have found that just active listening in general can be quite helpful. I think that another thing people should probably move into is after they learn the verbal judo, to find something that teaches you psychological first aid. That That is a lot harder to come by. I have found all of one course that was any good, and that was in the Army. It was a 40-hour class over a whole week, and it was freaking fabulous. I took a college course that wasn't even halfway on par. <laughs> and the the one that the Red Cross has... It's just, I, I have to shake my head and the little pamphlets that they give, it's just terrible. And I don't know if it's because they think that, oh, well, this should be the realm of counselors. Well, I'm sorry, peer to peer. I, I prefer talking to my friends. A counselor doesn't get it for me. So right. verbal judo is a, definitely a good way to start and learning how to do, uh, learning how to actively listen. But I think it also goes into psychological first aid afterwards. Construct. You know, for those unfamiliar, is worry 
experience, observe, decide, and act. And so you're you're turning around and you're you're getting that information and you're processing that information. You're deciding and you're acting. And like I said, the way verbal judo and the way acting does things, psychological first aid, to me, they all tie together in one 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 bigger concept. I agree. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us at Let's Regroup Building Stronger Citizens on Nights of Awakening, where we hope that you will awaken the night within.